I'm here because Jacqueline inspires me in her fight and her supporters inspire me too. And I want to lend my support wherever I can. Uh, and so much of our experience is similar. And I know that we are very, very strong as we get together. That it's more than just the two of us or 12 of us. That our fight is important for people all over this country. Peace. But what you have to imagine is a, a little room with a, a, a little table on it and groups of four at that end and four at that end. And they each have to sign, each person has to sign two to four thousand documents an hour. An hour. Oh, cool. And this is what they're signing. They're signing a court, an assignment of mortgage saying this mortgage was sold from this entity, the original lender, to this trust. They're signing a one, it's usually a one page document, assignment of mortgage, and they're signing, they say, and here I am, the officer of a bank or the lender, I'm a corporate officer, and here are the witnesses, and it all looks so good and official, and here's the notary, and it's all a pack of lies. What actually happens is that a person who's making eight to ten dollars an hour is sitting at the table signing 2,000 documents an hour. And they don't read it, they have no knowledge of anything in it. Uh, in one stack they are the Vice President of American Home Mortgage. In another stack they're the Vice President of Wells Fargo, the Vice President of American Servicing Company, the Vice President of Mortgage Electronic Registration Systems. But the number one thing is that tens of thousands of people all around the country are facing foreclosure with fraudulent documents from the banks and that hasn't changed one iota. Does it make a difference that they're fraudulent documents? If for certain judges, if any litigant walked into court with fraud and tried to foist fraudulent documents, they'd throw them out and say don't come back. That's happened in about two dozen cases that I know of countrywide where people have gotten, mm -hmm. been awarded their homes, but that's all. For most judges, there are dismissals, but not with prejudice. That means if you find your right paperwork, you can come back. Now, what this translates to amongst us is we have in this pocket a legitimate $100 bill. We have in this hand a phony $100 bill. We try paying our, our bill with a phony 100 and we get caught. And you say, oh, it's OK, I have a real one in the pocket here. Well, it doesn't matter. We're going off to jail for using the phony $100 bill. You know, so it really doesn't matter. But for banks, it does matter because we all know there's separate rules for banks because what we have learned over the last three years is they make the rules. We think we are governed by government, government but we're really governed by Wells Fargo and Jamie Dimon. And Jay. uh, <laughs> so here's the first assignment I found in Jacqueline's case, and it identifies the mortgage and the book number and the page number. There's no doubt that this is the assignment of Jacqueline's case uh, mortgage. And it is assigned for MERS, which is her, she had what's called a MERS mortgage. It was listed with the Mortgage Electronic Registration System. And this is signed by Natasha Clark. Is that what you're doing? Yeah, yeah Natasha Clark. And it's, she's supposed to be an Assistant Secretary of MERS. Well, through all this research of robo-signers and everything, who is Natasha Clark? She's actually a woman who worked in one of these mills in Fort Mill, South Carolina, who sat at a table and signed her name and signed 20 different job titles. She probably made $10 an hour, and this is just one of many she signed. When, according to her, did U.S. Bank buy Jacqueline's loan? Well, this is dated May 19, 2008. And it says effective November 1st, 2007. So they tried mm. to backdate it. Mm. So either November 1st, 2007 or sometime in 2008, U.S. Bank acquired this loan as a trustee. They don't say trustee for whom here. They should, but they forgot that part. So they leave that out there. Wow. Uh, and the, so the Rask Trust isn't even mentioned here. But one of the best parts on this, this is a MERS mortgage and it includes the word delivered. We, we, they swear, this woman who says she works for MERS and she never worked for MERS, swears that sh they delivered this mortgage to U.S. Bank. Well, that was fine because for three or four years, people from claiming to be MERS officers all over the country swore that they went into that big stainless steel MERS vault <laughs> yeah. and got these mortgage papers out and delivered them. Finally, around three years ago, during congressional hearings, 
officers of MERS admitted there is no stainless steel vault. MERS has never held a mortgage document, ever. Despite these allegations in thousands of cases that we went to our vault and got the document, they now said in congressional testimony we never held a single mortgage document. So this whole thing about delivering it from one to another, that's just another lie. And these dates here, why did these make me crazy? These dates made me crazy because I knew eventually that the RASC Trust 2006 EMX2 was going to claim to have acquired Jacqueline's mortgage. And each trust has a closing date. So go back to that monopoly bag of houses. When you're selling this bag of mortgages to investors, you say, and we'll have gathered all our loans by such and such a date by February 15, 2006, for example, if you're the RASC Trust. We'll have them in this. So there would be no reason for a trust that had a closing date in 2006 to be acquiring a loan in 2007 or 2008. So whenever I would see these late assignments to the trust, you can look up the, you know, all you have to do, you put, I put S, the, my, my big research tool is if I'm sophisticated, I put the words SEC, RASC Trust 2006 EMX2 closing date into my Google line and I will find almost nine times out of ten the closing date of that RASC Trust. You can go further than that and go into the SEC documents and everything, but my big research tool is I know how to use Google, as does everyone in this room. <laughs> so I mean, it's, it's, that, was, that was not sophisticated. So this was the first thing I saw. I saw that the assignments were late, I saw there was a lie about the liver, and so it was Natasha Clark and I knew that Natasha really worked for America Servicing Company in Fort Mill, South Carolina, and that since the big robo-signing scandal, this office in Fort Mill has been closed down by Wells Fargo, almost <coughs> an admission that maybe things weren't on the up and up then. Mm -hmm. But then we see this second one, which also lists Jacqueline's home mortgage, and <coughs> once again it lists MERS making the assignment. Now, you may ask yourself, if MERS successfully assigned its mortgage back in 2007, why is, what business does it have assigning something in 2011? Well, somebody seems to have figured out they forgot to list the name of the trust, so on this version they list the name of the trust. They don't say it's an amendment or anything, they just say, oh here, we're, we acquired this loan on 2011. The guy's name is Nicholas Hoy. I've written an article called Who's Robo-Signing Now? And the person I featured as the number one <laughs> robo-signer in the country was Nicholas Hoy. So when I looked at this one, I said, oh, this isn't hard either. This is a Nicholas Hoy. <laughs> All right. It's a Linda Green. This is a Nicholas Hoy. Uh, and again, this, the date makes no sense. But if you see the first mortgage, MERS has no interest to convey. It has already given away its interest back on that other document, remember? They have nothing to convey anymore. Um, but here they are giving the mortgage again, this time to the Rask Trust in 2011. And once again, it's signed by somebody who claims to be an employee of MERS, this time as nominee for the original lender. But we know Nicholas Hoy actually works for Wells Fargo. If you put Nicholas Hoy Wells Fargo into your Google line, you'll find lots of evidence that he's really working for Wells Fargo. And then, as if these two didn't happen, here comes assignment number three, because they needed an assignment, and I guess they were just really sloppy about what they were going to get, and again, it comes from Wells Fargo in Minnesota, and this time, it's dated October 3rd, 2011, and it goes from U.S. Bank, must have figured out that they were supposed to put in the name of the trust, to the U.S. Bank as trustee. Well, that's fine, except that U.S. Bank is relying on that first crazy assignment from Natasha Clark to own anything, and it ignores that the second assignment made three months before is inconsistent with this one. So when did the RASC Trust acquire Jacqueline Barber's mortgage? Who the heck knows? Not on these four dates. That's what I'd be willing to say, that it didn't acquire it on these four dates. Did it acquire it with these documents? No, nothing was passed. These were documents made for the purpose of frustrating people like Joshua on a daily basis. Who looks at these and knows, you look at these and know, you look at these and know that they are worthless lies. That the bank is manufacturing documents so that it can foreclose and that in any other scheme 
this would be a white collar scheme that would be prosecuted. But when attorneys go into court to try to say these documents are fraudulent, they get shot down on a regular basis. And even though there has been a nationwide mortgage settlement that addresses these kinds of practices, 2012, if you go in and look at mortgage assignments to trusts, even trusts that were closed in 2005 and 2006, were closed years and years ago, you're still seeing assignments being made today, particularly in Minnesota by Wells Fargo, assi supposedly assigning documents to trusts. Now they have all kinds of excuses for this, and my favorite, when uh, 60 Minutes ran its piece by some of the servicers and banks and said, do you want to respond to this before we put it on the air? We got a letter back from American Home Mortgage Servicing in Texas that started talking about what I was calling forgeries, and they said, yes, we'd like to address the issue of surrogate signing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> surrogate signing? What the heck is surrogate signing? Oh yes, Linda Green told everyone that they were authorized to sign her name. <laughs> on, a, on, a, on a witness and <laughs> document, but yes, but yes that, that letter exists out there from 60 Minutes. So they call it surrogate signing. And as for why these are misdated, their number one excuse is, well, we had the real ones in the vault. Go back to the $100 bill example. We had the real ones in the vault, but it was cheaper for investors if we just recreated them. Well, you, did you tell the did you tell the homeowner? Did you tell the court that these were recreations and not original documents? No. But in addition to that, each time they went into that vault where they had to pull out the note, the assignment was supposed to be right behind it. So why would it be cheaper to pay some folks in Fort Mill, South Carolina, or Alfreda, Georgia, to make new ones? It wouldn't be cheaper. How many fraudulent mortgage assignments do I believe there are in the country? I believe there's eight million. Yeah. There's, I've counted everyone in Palm Beach County. <laughs> Stay up a lot. <laughs> Some days I get a lot of research and I watch all three football games and I print this stuff out. <laughs> so there's 1,857 mortgage assignments signed by Linda Green and the Doc X folks in Palm Beach County. That's just one of the mills. There are over 12 mills around the country. And in an 18 month period, those 1,800 mortgage assignments transferred over a half a billion dollars in mortgages in my county, mm -hmm. in one county. And I believe this is as widespread in South Florida as it is in California, as it is in Arizona, as it is in Nevada. But the Attorney General's office can send one person for every 10 that banks can send. You know, we're, we're understaffed, we're underfunded in this fight, and we lose every day. The only consistent winners are the occupied people. The ones that really are able to get the banks to modify mortgages are the occupied people, more so than what I see.